Shannon Sharp is undoubtedly one of the greatest tight ends in NFL history. After 14 seasons, he left the league as a multi-time champion and pro bowler, setting records in all major categories while revolutionizing how the position is played today. Besides his incredible numbers, Sharp is the definition of a character. He thrived in the spotlight, quick to either gloat the journalists or trash his opponents on and off the field. His phenomenal career, mixed with that excellent gift of gab, helped propel him to media stardom. We know who this dude is. TV personality, Hall of Fame tight end, Shannon Sharp. But greatness often commands the most attention, outweighing the path it takes to get there. We'll remember Sharp as a legend, but he once had to fight for attention from NFL scouts. A guy too small and slow for the pros. Someone who didn't belong. And the dude who would never escape his brother's shadow. Let's meet these versions of Shannon Sharp in the prison. NFL scouts have a type. Teams typically prefer talented prospects who come from major programs and have specific physiques for certain positions. Shannon didn't fit the bill. He spent four years as a receiver at Savannah State University, a small historically black college in South Georgia that competed in Division II. Strike one. More than the competition he faced, NFL general managers struggled to identify his fit in the pros. They labeled him a tweener. As a lifelong short king, standing at nearly six foot two with a muscular build sounds lovely, but scouts didn't agree. They were aware of Shannon's strength, but thought he lacked the tools to block effectively, which was an essential skill needed to be a successful tight end. Strike two. Despite the uphill battle, Shannon did have one pivotal source of inspiration for success. He wanted to follow in the footsteps of his older brother, Sterling, who starred for the Green Bay Packers. Shannon idolized Sterling. As a talented three-sport athlete in high school, Shannon stuck with football because of his brother. When it came time to pick a college, Shannon trusted his brother's advice and chose Savannah State instead of waiting for an opportunity at a bigger school. Sterling set the blueprint, and Shannon followed every step down to the jersey number. Making it to the NFL was the next step, which Shannon made a compelling case for. He put up amazing numbers at Savannah State, transforming the football program while garnering comparisons to Jerry Rice from opposing coaches in the process. Shannon felt proud of his legacy of being a big shark in a small pond at Savannah State, but the NFL wanted their big fish to come from a much larger pond. Scouts loved his pass catching skills, but just couldn't project the Division II player to the pros, even when that Division II player set records as an All-American. They saw Shannon as just another guy in a weak wide receiver draft class. Down two strikes in the count, Shannon got drafted. It just wasn't until the seventh round by the Denver Broncos. While Shannon felt disappointed dropping that far, he simply wanted to prove himself. But the pressures of making it as a seventh rounder didn't compare to the added weight that had followed him for years. As much as Shannon wanted to be his older brother, Sterling's success cast a massive shadow over Shannon that seemed impossible to escape. Every step of the way to the NFL, Shannon drew comparisons to his older brother. Shannon had to take a back seat while Sterling rode shotgun because everyone from the media to himself got stuck in comparing the two, which left Shannon at a disadvantage from the jump. By Shannon's senior year in high school, Sterling was an All-American receiver at South Carolina. Shannon earned All-American status as well, but you know, the whole Division II thing. The Green Bay Packers selected Sterling seventh overall in the 1988 draft whereas Shannon wasn't taken until the seventh round. Even when Shannon entered the league, his older bro was fresh off an all-pro season. Back in high school, Shannon grew so irritated with being attached to his brother that he made it his mission to improve on everything he did. Before his first snap as a rookie, he was already behind the eight ball and journalists believed he would always be Sterling's little brother. 
It's a label that even Shannon grew comfortable with as he matured going into his first season. Although, one thing that separated Shannon from his brother and led Denver to draft him was his size. The Broncos grew tired of seeing their smaller receivers often injured, and Shannon immediately came in with a larger build than three of Denver's starting receivers. But Shannon finding his identity outside of his brother didn't matter nearly as much as the Broncos identifying how to get him on the field. Shannon barely survived the final roster cuts as a rookie. Denver planned on releasing him heading into the final 1990 preseason game, but Shannon earned a spot on the squad by making the most of his limited opportunities through blocking. Earning a roster spot is an accomplishment for a seventh round pick, but Denver didn't know what to do with Shannon during his first two seasons. The Broncos tested him out in different positions with little success. Some weeks the depth chart had him at receiver, other weeks he was a tight end. Toward the end of his rookie season, Denver moved him to H-back, which is similar to a tight end, but one that sets up behind the line of scrimmage. He started gaining more playing time at the spot, but still ended the year with unimpressive numbers. The following year was more of the same. Denver entered their 91 camp and shut down playing Shannon out wide, shifting his focus to H-back with potential to get some burn at tight end. But he had competition. Eight-year veteran Clarence K held down the starting role in all his seasons, and the team drafted tight end Reggie Johnson in the second round, both of whom who were known for their blocking abilities, something Shannon had yet to show consistency in. He managed to start several games as the H-back, but predominantly shined as a special teams player, where he got crowned for his play on that side of the ball late in the season. It's an honorable accomplishment for most seventh rounders living out their dreams in the pros, but couldn't be what young Shannon envisioned when he vowed to one-up his brother. Although offensively, he did show signs of promise. During a week 15 matchup, Shannon's pass catching was what led to head coach Dan Reeves praising his ability to be a matchup problem for opposing defenses. It's a great compliment, and Shannon had a more productive year in his second season but Denver had to determine if he provided enough value going forward. Shannon was due for a new contract, but getting a new deal done didn't appear to be their top priority. As the team entered free agency in the 92 season, they signed former Rookie of the Year tight end Rob Awalt, adding more depth to an already crowded room. Awalt, unlike Johnson and Kay, was more known for his pass catching abilities rather than blocking, which spelled potential trouble for Shannon, who had yet to strike a deal. But as injuries piled up for Denver's receiving group, the Broncos signed Shannon to a new contract, ending a 12-day holdout. Shannon showed immense improvement toward the end of the previous season, and with receivers sidelined to start the new year, he took full advantage of the opportunity. Denver's offense evolved running more sets that involved two-back looks where Shannon thrived as both an H-back and motion tight end. By week seven, Shannon shocked the NFL with his production, leaving journalists stunned as he set a team record in two games. The media wasn't the only one taking notice of Shannon's play. Hundreds of rabid fantasy football players flooded Denver's office with calls asking about Shannon. Fans hardly knew who he was and needed to know what position he played so they could use him correctly. The calls became so overwhelming, the front office felt the need to respond, asserting that Shannon was their tight end. For multiple years, Denver couldn't identify Shannon's position, but people like Jim from accounting who wanted to win their office fantasy league twisted the org's arm and the team felt proud to claim Shannon as their tight end. It's an unconventional journey, but Shannon made it easy for the Broncos. He finished that season as Denver's leader in receptions and earned his first Pro Bowl selection. Journalists were so impressed, they named him as one of the biggest surprises of the 92 season as he made strides to rid both the tweener and little bro labels that followed him since being drafted. From that year on, Shannon didn't look back. During the 93 and 94 seasons, he ascended to stardom, becoming the focal point of Denver's passing offense. But just as Shannon started to come into his own, Sterling's impact on his career took a drastic turn. After the 1994 season, 
a neck injury forced Sterling into retirement, which left Shannon so devastated that he contemplated the idea of calling it quits himself. Like his brother, Shannon dealt with his own set of injuries, suffering from both chronic knee and ankle pain. Shannon felt his body falling apart, and as someone who gets back aches from sleeping awkwardly, it's understandable for him to want to hang up the cleats. Shannon wanted to use the 95 season to gauge his future, but even mentioning the idea of retirement after five seasons showed the severity of the situation. Watching someone he admired be stripped of their ability to play forced that level of reflection, and Shannon dedicated the 95 campaign to Sterling. A year in which he finished earning his fourth straight Pro Bowl selection. Shannon decided to keep at it, and despite fighting off being traded over contract negotiations, he put up numbers in 96. And in 97, helped lead Denver to a Super Bowl appearance against his brother's former team. Although Shannon built a name for himself in a short amount of time, it's not far-fetched to think the label of Sterling's little bro would have stuck with him at that moment if he left the game early. I mean, it's how Shannon viewed himself. As the Broncos were set to face off against the Packers in the 98 Super Bowl, Shannon addressed the media before the game, saying he would always be Sterling's little brother. Maybe Shannon felt empathy for his brother, who could no longer play the game they bonded over. Denver went on to win the Super Bowl that year, but even before Shannon grabbed his first title, no matter what he believed, he had outgrown the little brother tag. He was one of the league's premier tight ends, deep in the process of blazing his own trail. And the years that followed after hoisting his first trophy only cemented that. There is no denying that both brothers were elite pass catchers, but Shannon was unique in revolutionizing his position. No matter where you lined them up on the field, Shannon presented mismatched problems for opposing defenses and in the process helped lay the foundation of how teams utilize their tight ends today. All while being one of the best trash talkers in the history of the NFL. While Sterling shied away from the media, Shannon thrived in the spotlight, which helps make him such a unique media personality today. I mean, what other media figure can you say almost fought one of the teams they cover? Anyway, while Sterling created an imposing shadow for his brother to overcome, there is no refuting that Shannon became his own person. It's quite clear to see that now, but projecting a seventh rounder whose own team couldn't identify him into a trailblazing Hall of Fame tight end surely made those NFL scouts and GMs consider getting LASIK surgery. Yo, thanks for watching Prism. Remember, never let the haters doubt you. But good thing they do exist because it gives us more content. Check out that episode of Prism and others in our Prismverse. Adios.